Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world from the IATEL for Young Learners and Teens SIG Committee. I'm Bruno Andrade, Public Relations Coordinator, and I'm delighted to welcome Claire Venables, who's our March webinar speaker. Just a second, because something just went down here. I don't see my screen. Okay, back to normal. Can you see me? So, Claire spent a decade teaching in Europe where she obtained her Trinity Deep Tissot um, at Oxford TEFL. She has a wide range of experience as a teacher, teacher trainer, director of studies, and materials writer. However, her true passion is teaching young English to primary and pre-primary learners. Since moving to Brazil in 2011, she's been involved in the creation and implementation of language programs in schools, teaching training courses, and course book writing for Macmillan. She's an active member of the National English Teachers Association, Brastiso, and a board member of two special interest groups, Voices for Women and Young Learners and Teens and the director of Active English. So without any further ado, over to you, Claire. Oh, thank you very much for having me. It's so lovely to be here. I mean, anyone who knows me knows I love what I do. And how important it is to me to connected to other ELT professionals to help strengthen and grow our teaching community. And let me just say really quickly that the Young Learner Team SIG has been a constant source of support and resources throughout my career. So naturally, I feel honoured to have been invited to do this webinar and connect with this international community of Young Learner Teachers. I was just taking a look in the, in the chat there and we've got people from all around the world joining me this morning on a Sunday. So I'm, I'm very happy to have you all here. This is a topic that is of great interest to me as a professional but also on a very personal level as a mother of a bilingual child. So welcome to this session, everybody, on integrating pronunciation into the teaching of English to young learners. As Bruno mentioned, I'm Claire Venables, and in this session, I'm going to be exploring the key question of, and let me just get my slide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This key question, and I'd like you to this key question. Young learner teachers to Is it even worth dedicating our limited class time to this? It may seem like a funny way to be starting a session on pronunciation, but really, this is this is what I'd like to address. We're going to look at We're going to look at what a teacher needs to know about pronunciation. We're going to have a look at pronunciation and uh, language acquisition. And I wanted to provide you today with some really practical examples so that tomorrow when you go back into your class you might feel uh, inspired to give a few new things a go. So this is our session today. Let me see if I can turn up my volume a little bit for people who can't hear me. How does that sound? Does, did the sound just improve? Great. Excellent. Okay, so let's jump straight into it. Is it even worth doing pronunciation with kids? I mean, don't children just pick it up? Isn't that something that we've heard uh, so many times before? This seems to be uh, a message that I've heard a lot. In fact, I've even heard people say, don't children who start early manage to obtain native-like pronunciation? 
Well, there certainly has been a lot written about the advantages of an early start in language learning. And for a long time, it was thought that there was this critical period within which children could acquire other languages with greater ease and that this cut off at around puberty. You might have heard of that hypothesis before. Well, there is empirical evidence that disputes the hypothesis that there's a biological advantage, but there's still research that suggests that listening and pronunciation are two areas which benefit most from an early start. However, before we jump to any conclusions about the possible implications on this on our teaching practice, we have to take a closer look at the context of the learners in this research and then compare it to our own. I want to just take a minute to do a quick survey. In the chat here, if you could just answer these questions for me. Let me know how old are your learners? How many lessons do they have each week? How many hours per lesson and how many, how many hours of homework do they have? Mm, we've got lots of people writing there. Okay, so 50 minute lessons. Christina, would you mind telling me how many um, hours a week that is? So, oh, sorry, was that five 50 minute lessons? Great, so every day, two hours a week. Did any that's a very typical context where I'm teaching as well, twice a week? Yep. Two lessons a week, two hours? Yep. Three lessons a week. Sylvie, how long do your lessons last? Okay, very little homework, three times a week though. One hour per lesson, so it's three hours a week. 45, Sylvie's lessons are 45 minutes long. Three lessons a week, Bruno. And 15 year olds. Okay, so that's two and a half hours over three lessons. Okay. Hey, Thelma, 40 minutes, five times a week. Okay. So, okay. So I'm kind of getting a pattern here. A lot of us are teaching two, three times a week. Some people up to five times a week, which is great. But what I've, I've seen to um, have come across in my career, at least, is these English courses have kids looking at or ex exposed to English around twice a week, around two hours. And it seems to be fairly common to in the group that we have watching us today. Kind of two hours a week seems to be the norm. Now, if we compare the children in, in this research that was done to our own EFL context, it's very, very different. These children in the research were placed in immersion context, surrounded by the foreign languages uh, in nurseries without any contact with their mother tongue. And this is dramatically different to what our learners are experiencing. English is a foreign language. If you're living in a country where English is not an official language or widely, widely spoken in the community, it's fair to say that the primary source and the main place where students receive English input is the classroom. And for most students, at least in the countries where I've taught and where many of you have taught, this is limited to once or twice a week, adding up to no more than a few hours. So even if we consider the, the influence nowadays of the internet, of music and of videos that these kids are watching outside of the classroom, which has certainly increased the number of hours that uh, our students are exposed to the, the language, it's still a far cry from the experience of most of the children in these case studies who are immersed in the foreign language for hours every day. And at this point, I wanted to share a little anecdote with you um, from my personal experience raising my son as a bilingual child. I've only spoken to my son in English since the day he was born, and his father only speaks in Portuguese. Since he was about one and a half, we've lived here in Brazil. Now, He's had English classes at school as well from the age of three, an hour every day. And I've never made an effort to teach him English formally. But he's grown up speaking both languages fluently. 
Um, can you imagine how many more hours my child has been exposed to English in comparison to your average student? Right? Well, even so, he has an unmistakable Brazilian English accent and has even experienced communication breakdowns in Australia due to his pronunciation, which is not always intelligible, especially to listeners who are not used to the Brazilian accent. So for me, this really drives home the need to work on pronunciation with young learners and not believe the myth that children are just going to pick it up. It, there he is. There's my favourite young learner, that Billowy. Oh. So that also highlights the fact to me that we really need to be providing, as teachers, a good model. And here's a quote from Davison Laverne. It is vital that children receive a good model of pronunciation from the very beginning of their foreign language experience. But what is a good model exactly? Thanks, Susanna. Um, if we accept this idea that the classroom is the main place where our learners hear and use English orally, we should also recognise that the teachers are an important source of input and need to provide a good model for their students. So, okay, I know this is a really delicate topic to talk about. As many non-native English speaking teachers who are perfectly proficient, highly proficient, but do not have English as their first language, have all too often spent years hearing that native speakers make the best teachers. And one of the arguments for this has typically been pronunciation. Like, I've heard it so... Has anybody else heard that? Has anybody else been exposed to that kind of discrimination before as perhaps a proficient language, uh, a proficient speaking English teacher, but who does not have English as their mother tongue? Yeah, Amanda. Exactly, Amanda. That is when I've heard it. Amanda's commenting here that she, as an academic manager, she's had to hear this all the time from parents. And Amanda, that is exactly my next point. Um, as a coordinator and as a native uh, speaker of English, or uh, English is my mother tongue, um, I've heard that a lot as well from parents who express their concern that the children are going to pick up the wrong accent or that they want their child to speak like a native. Oh. Well, this is not only a what this is not only widespread discrimination. It's not true, and my son is living proof. A native-like accent is no longer even a goal for us in 2018. And this is the message that you're going to hear over and over again, more and more, as we move towards creating a fairer ELT industry. So I suggest that we all make a commitment to ending this idea that we need to have an accent from a specific country to be a good model for our students. Let's instead uh, work towards developing some pronunciation goals that are more realistic and more useful for ourselves and our learners, right? I mean, okay, having said that, let's also agree that pronunciation matters. Pronunciation matters just as much as having good vocabulary, good grammar, accuracy and fluency. I feel like I'm probably preaching to the choir here uh, because if you've dedicated your Sunday, an hour of your Sunday, to listening to me talk about pronunciation, I'm pretty sure you're already convinced about the benefits of pronunciation. But what does a teacher really need to know to be able to teach pronunciation? Well, I believe that every teacher would benefit from learning the basics of phonology. There's something really empowering about knowing, I don't know that there are over 40 consonants and vowels, or understanding word stress and rhythm and intonation. And personally, I might be um, an ELT nerd, I don't know if there's anyone else here, I love the IPA. And you should also be aware of what aspects of English pronunciation can cause, cause difficulties for your learners. And I mean, who better to do that than a native speaker of the language, right? I mean, that's another argument in favour of, of having uh, teachers who are not monolingual but bilingual. I encourage you all to get your hands on some books that are going to help you build up your knowledge and consequently your confidence with teaching pronunciation. 
Um, Adrian Underhill's book, Sound Foundations, is a great place to start. And Mark Hancock's book, Pronunciation Games, is loved by teachers everywhere. And there's that great book, How to Teach Pronunciation, by Jerry Kelly, which is also very useful. There are lots of things out there, uh, books out there, that you can use. And when we're talking about developing as a teacher and de developing our English as a teacher, I want to give a shout out to Igor Cavalcanti, who's done lots of wonderful work and published lots of wonderful things about the importance of teachers improving their proficiency. And he's got some great publications written for the ELT community. So he's someone else. That's just a couple of little ideas of where you can start out if you want to uh, develop more knowledge about pronunciation. So, mm -hmm. so the the importance of pronunciation in, in learning in the learning of additional language is what we're going to talk about next. Can we justify spending time on pronunciation? I mean, with everything else, all our other priorities and expectations, what are the benefits for our learners? Well, here are a couple of interesting facts about children learning languages that might help you answer this question. <coughs> and I'm just going to try and find the slide. Hmm, okay, the slide's not there. So I'm going to read these to you. According to John Morley, intelligible, intelligible pronunciation is an essential component of communicative competence. Pronunciation errors, and this, this was really interesting to me when I read about this, pronunciation errors can cause as many or even more communication breakdowns as grammar or lexus. I was surprised when I heard that. Um, Yates explains that learners with good pronunciation in English are more likely to be understood even if they make errors in other areas, whereas learners whose pronunciation is difficult to understand will not be understood even if their grammar is perfect. I mean, maybe that shouldn't surprise me so much. <laughs> as, as, a, uh, as I struggle myself with my pronunciation in Brazilian Portuguese, people can still understand me, um, I think, I think my pronunciation is intelligible, um, even when my grammar is not, I think I can get, get by. <laughs> pronunciation plays a role, an important role, not only in a learner's ability to be understood when communicating, but did you know that it also directly affects their ability to understand spoken English? So we're now crossing over from uh, productive skills to receptive skills. And phonological awareness, or the ability to hear the sounds and syllables in English, directly affect literacy development as well. And that's something that Lynn Cameron talks about in her book. I'll have all of these references for you in my last slide. So we've looked at some strong arguments there in favour of devoting precious class time to working on pronunciation. But I believe what often puts a lot of young learner teachers off this area is not knowing what to teach. Well, most authors agree that the focus should be on working on those aspects of pronunciation which affect intelligibility. So you don't have to worry. Uh, actually, Jenna Jenkins uh, has even proposed a syllabus uh, for English as a lingua franca, and that describes what our priorities should be for obtaining mutual intelligibility. Fantastic. So this is an excellent reference for you to check out. There's a lot of pronunciation work that can be done also in response to the problems uh, that teachers hear while monitoring their students' oral production, much in the same way that you do with grammar and vocabulary, right? So just this look at that, a tiny little change, just raising your awareness, uh, noticing, starting to notice, look out, not just for grammar and vocabulary, uh, giving feedback on grammar and vocabulary, but starting Becoming more aware of giving feedback also on pronunciation can really make a difference. But as, Ke as Kelly points out, there needs to be a move towards planned pronunciation teaching as well. And that can be as simple as taking into consideration the potential difficulties that your learners might have with the language that you're planning to revise or introduce in that lesson. 
and we can highlight the advantage again of being uh, uh, a native speaker of your learner's L1 here. Being able to predict what areas of pronunciation will be challenging for your students is a real advantage here. My goal in this talk is to highlight ways of making pronunciation teaching viable for every young learner teacher. And I think these two tips are enough to get you started. Listen out for pronunciation problems and respond to them. That's something that I'm trying to do with my child now, not just ignore them hoping that they're going to go away on their own with more exposure. Respond to these problems and predict difficulties that your learners will have when you're planning and thinking of ways that you work on these as a lesson. So that's a great jump off point. But this brings me now to the most important part of my, my talk, and that is the how. So how can we teach pronunciation? There's been some amazing results from teachers who have used an analytic linguistic approach. And that's one which uses information and tools such as the phonetic alphabet, uh, charts of vocal apparatus, contrasting information, and other different kinds of aids to supplement listening, imitation, production. In fact, I encourage all the pronunciation enthusiasts watching to check out the color-coded mimic chart created by Margaret Oregon. Really nice. But tonight, or today, wherever you are in the world, as promised, I'd like to look at ways that you can work on developing your young learner's pronunciation using the activities that you're already doing. That's through games, songs, rhymes, chants, stories, and with your teacher talk. So we're going to be taking another approach, or I'm going to be sharing some ideas that take another approach here. Let's have a look. Let's start off with games. So, Games, pronunciation in games. There are lots of traditional children's games that use songs and chants. For example, the playground game, What's the Time, Mr. Wolf? Has anyone ever played that game before as a child or with their learners? Well, you're about, uh, Jessica, Susanna, you're about to learn a great game that you can use with your class on Monday. This game is really fun, no materials, no prep, my favourite kind of activity, um, and is suitable for a whole range of children in small or big groups. Basically, what's the time Mr. Wolf involves a group of children asking this question repeatedly to another child, who's the wolf, who answers back with different times. <coughs> it's, a, <coughs> it's a playground game, but you can set this up in a space in your classroom too. One child, the wolf, is at one end of the room and the other children at the other. So what's the time, Mr. Wolf? And the wolf will reply, I don't know, it's five o'clock. And the children take that corresponding number of steps forward in direction of the wolf. And they keep asking the question. What's the time, Mr. Wolf? Do you see how this becomes almost like a drill? The children drill these sentences over and over again and listen to all of the different features of pronunciation that are going on in these, not just this game, but in all of these kinds of games that have this repetitive chant-like um, quality to them. What's the time, Mr. Wolf? It's five o'clock. One, two, three and they keep moving forward, forward, waiting to hear the wolf cry out, dinner time. And when they hear that, they have to all run back to the start without getting caught. And if you are caught, you become the wolf and the game repeats. So this is what makes games. This, this game, and many other games, just like this one, with this, these same qualities, provide a natural and fun context for that drill-like repetition of this formulaic language. So this makes them the perfect vehicle for teaching chunks of language and features of pronunciation like connected speech and sentence stress. I mean, just perfect. Other games like Duck, Duck, Goose. This is, a, this is a classic game, Duck, Duck, Goose. 
this is one I wanted to uh, share with you because although you may have played the traditional version before, you might not know that this game can be adapted to be played in many different ways. And some of these ways can focus on specific problems, either in response to or in anticipation of pronunciation problems. You all know this game, I'm sure. The students sit in a circle and another child walks around the outside of that circle, gently tapping their peers as they chant, duck, 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 duck. And when they say the word goose, that child who is tapped must jump up and chase the first child around the circle, trying to catch her before she sits down in the now empty space in the circle. Super easy game, really easy to teach, possibly familiar to the children already. And by adapting this game, it could be work, used to work on any pair of words that contain challenging sounds for the learners. Think about minimal pairs, uh, long or short vowel sounds, or even singular and plural nouns. As you can imagine, this activity provides lots and lots of opportunities for both production and recognition. So presenting this in the format of a game makes it a whole new level of fun, much more engaging and consequently much more memorable for our learners. Um, the last one here uh, that I'll talk to you about really quickly is Walk Don't Touch. Now, Walk Don't Touch is a game that um, I've been using a lot. You probably haven't heard of it because I'm pretty sure I made it up. Um, but I've been using it all the time for lots of different things. And it is a specifically for group formation, but that's a whole another webinar. Um, so I've been using Walk Don't Touch as well for pronunciation. And if you have students in uh, a nice big space walking around, uh, you chant Walk Don't Touch, Walk Don't Touch, Walk Don't Touch, and stop. And the students have to stop facing uh, a partner. And uh, you can get them to say something to each other. They can have a, an oral exchange with each other. Or, if you wanted to work on pronunciation, you could have them with cut have minimal pairs on them, or they have to try and find their minimal pair in the room. All these kinds of games that have these kinds of characteristics of what's the time to fall, duck, duck, goose, and what don't touch, are just perfect. You're already doing them in class. Children love games. Give it a pronunciation twist. It's easy. Okay, so that was some good ideas for games. I hope you like those. I hope you feel inspired to give some go. Let's move on to songs, rhymes, and chants. Classic in the young learner classroom. Everybody's doing them. Thanks, Susanna. Um, songs, rhymes, and chants for pronunciation. Rhymes introduce children naturally and effectively to the complete sounds of English as well as to stress and intonation. What a great quote. Songs and chants are used with children even before they begin to speak. And this type of pre-linguistic play, as Cook calls it, is said to be invaluable for babies to perceive phonemic contrast. There is no doubt that they are a wonderful way to develop L1 and have so much potential for the L2 classroom. In the book Language Play, Language Learning by Cook, I love this book, he gives two wonderful examples of children's rhymes that have been used, that I've used time and time again with my pre, these are pre-primary learners, but you could adapt them uh, for primary learners as well. Both of them are examples of rhymes that, um, although they don't carry much semantic meaning for the language learner initially, they provide rich exposure to the features of English pronunciation which the language teacher can exploit. The first rhyme is called This Little Piggy. And does anybody know This Little Piggy? This little piggy is traditionally used after a child's bath when they're being dried off by their parents. Okay, it goes like this. You're going to love it, Susanna. Um, you take your student's foot, or you can have them with each other's feet, and you grab their big toe and you go, This little piggy went to market. This little piggy stayed home. And you go toe by toe. This little piggy had roast beef, and this little piggy had none. 
and this little thingy went Wee! and then on wee 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 you tickle them all the way up to their um, pedal to their belly or something like this. It's like this wonderful cute little game that you can play with them. And listen to all of that fascinating language uh, pronunciation and what's going on there with that little chant. This little piggy went to market. This little piggy stayed home. This little piggy had first leaf. And this little piggy had none. It's just incredible. It's just incredible. And in the book, and I really encourage you to read this book again, references in the last line. He the cook breaks down this rhyme and all it explains everything that's going on um, inside this, this chant. It's fascinating. Fascinating. And it's something so simple that we can do. So simple that we can do. Um, the next one is Round and Round the Garden Works in the same way. Oh, sorry. The next one is Eeny, Meeny, Miny, Mo. This is great for primary learners. Oh, my goodness. So even with older learners, our primary learners, who may have a larger vocabulary and perhaps can understand parts of what they're chanting or singing, most of these rhymes are full of nonsensical language, and yet they're still highly beneficial for language development. Without any need to grade language, or translate anything to their mother tongue, you can use the, these kinds of rhymes, finger plays, skipping and clapping games confidently, knowing that your students will respond enthusiastically and reap the benefits. This is known as an intuitive, uh, imitative approach to pronunciation. It depends on the learner's ability to listen and imitate the rhythms and sounds of the target language without the intervention or any kind of explicit uh, information. Mariana, my last slide is going to have uh, all of the names of these books that I'm mentioning and all of my references, okay? Okay, so, um, Eeny, Meeny, Miny, Mo has, makes absolutely no sense. Okay, but this is so much fun. You've got to try this with, you, with your kids, and I'm sure you're going to have as much fun with it as, as we have. So everybody puts their fist into the middle of the circle like this. this. This makes no sense, but it has a functional purpose. You use this game to decide who is going to be the chosen one for a game, or who's going to be it. So your fists go into the circle like this, and you chant, Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a tiger by the toe. If he squeals, let him go, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. And that person is either it or out, and you can keep going. Now, uh, I wish I could share this link with you. On my Instagram account, I, I was able to capture the moment when my students started doing this freely and spontaneously on their own during free playtime. And we'd only done the chant a couple of times, so there were a lot of mistakes in there, but it was incredible how quickly and how much they picked up. Um, and they just love it and they use it all the time, even when they're not in English class. They use the easy meaning of my name. Another great one is Gimme Five. Does everybody know Gimme Five? Gimme Five, it's, a, it's a, like a Gimme Five, on the side, up high, down low, too slow, Gimme Ten, missed again. All of these kinds of chants that use rhyme and rhythm can be exploited in our classroom for teaching pronunciation as well, particularly as you start with your older learners now, older primary learners, start to move towards looking at the written form of the language, learning about rhyme uh, and that, that uh, connection that it has to spelling is really, really wonderful. So that's another one. Give me five on the side, up high, down low, too slow, give me ten, missed again. All these kinds of chants you can use successfully. Um, okay, so you know that songs and chants can be used to work more explicitly on language, which appears in your curriculum, such as that, but you know those isolated vocabulary items and lexical chunks, and you've probably already used songs with your young learners before. So I'd like to make a different suggestion today uh, for a way that you could do it that you might not have tried before. Have you ever tried to get your young learners to create their own songs and chants? Hmm. Well, when we allow students to use English creatively like this, 
by giving them a sense of ownership of the language. They can experiment, take risks, personalise the language so it's meaningful and more memorable. And they're also perfect for teaching features of pronunciation, such as strong and weak forms, sentence stress, and the pronunciation of any kind of challenging phonemes, rhythm and stress. Sylvie. Oh, Sylvie's creating her own chants with her students using flashcards. That's a wonderful idea. Okay, well, if you haven't tried, if you haven't tried creating songs with your students, I'm going to share a way of doing this with you now. Writing your own. This has come from a great book, which is again in the reference page, by Carolyn Graham. Um, and she says that um, she provides this great, uh, great advice and step-by-step -step process for, for getting children to create their own songs, rhymes, and chants. So to do this activity, though, let, let's, let's, we need to bear in mind something. We need to bear in mind that this is a task for children who are already reading and writing in English but may not have had exposure to writing in this genre, even in their first language, you know. So they're going to need a lot of support and more than one opportunity to try it out over the course of the school year. So you can provide support for this activity with the following. First of all, making sure you're teaching lots of vocabulary in context, not just word lists. Give them lots of opportunities to see and hear language in context through storytelling, uh, through circle time, sharing news. Um, there's lots of ways to do this. You're going to need to teach them explicitly about syllables and rhyming words. So that's something that they will need to be taught. You should also give them access to the tools for finding rhyming words. And I've just included a website there that's fantastic for this. So if you're lucky enough to have internet access in your classroom, you can use this website with them or get them to access, access it themselves. You also need to scaffold the activity. And you do this, first of all, by modeling how to create a chart first, and then creating one together before letting them try it on their own in pairs. And this doesn't have to be done in one lesson. It can be stretched over, out over a series of lessons. So here are the steps for creating your own jazz chant or song that I've adapted from Carolyn Graham's book. This is a classic book. Put your hands on it uh, if you can. Write a list of key words. Okay. So, uh, these could be the words that you uh, that might be related to the theme that you're working on, or it could be useful classroom language that you want to teach, or it could even be the students' names if you're starting off with a new group, you know. So it's around 10 words. You then uh, want to make a list of rhyming words, words that rhyme with those keywords. And you can send the students here to rhyme zone that I mentioned before, for example, to help them out. Then you write a list of individual words or phrases uh, to describe or add information to your list of words. Uh, let me think of an example here. If you were doing food vocabulary, you would then add like extra words to that food vocabulary, like fresh, frozen, delicious. And then you're going to divide the words into groups according to their number of syllables. Okay, so those are the steps. Oh, Sylvie. Sorry, I'm just looking at that. I just got distracted here by Sylvie's comment in the chat. Can everybody see that? Thank you so much for sharing that lovely idea. She's using flashcards and letting the, the students create their own chant uh, using fl the flashcards. That's wonderful. Wonderful. Maybe the next step could be, and I'm not sure if your students are reading and writing yet, but maybe the next step could be then getting them to add adjectives. To describe these animals, and then you could even like get it going a little bit further. Um, yeah. So we're going to look at storytelling now. And oh, sorry, I didn't finish off the last step for creating their own chant. So once you've done all of this, the simplest thing to do, if this is your first time doing it, is simply to take uh, a tune that everybody's already familiar with and then add these new lyrics uh, to this tune according to how many syllables are needed and the rhyming words. It's the easiest thing in the world. You don't have to be creating 
uh, new tunes or anything like that, you can use one. You can even use one so that are in your course book. You know, you can take uh, take that uh, really maybe less uh, meaningful song that you might find in your course book, and you can get the students to personalise it using this, these lists that they've just created. So let's talk about one of my favourite things to do with young learners and something that I believe is a skill that every young learner teacher should develop and that's storytelling. I'm a huge fan of storytelling. When choosing a story and preparing to read it aloud to your students, there are some very specific things that you can do that will make story time useful for teaching vocabulary but also for teaching pronunciation. Okay, So here are my top tips for using storytelling effectively as a way for teaching pronunciation in English. First of all, look at the language in the book. You want to look for stories that have a lot of rhyme and or repetition. Okay. Um, when you're, so I'm just going back to a comment that I want to make about the first point, looking at the language of the book. When I say this, look at the language, look at the words used and make sure that these books haven't been graded so much that they become unnatural. I was doing a storytelling workshop with a group of wonderful teachers and they brought along a lot of these big books. And when I started to look at the big books, I realised that not, there were no contractions used whatsoever. And then the teacher was using these big books as a read aloud, because that's what big books are for, right? But because there were no contractions, it sounded like a robot. She sounded like a robot while she was reading, and it became this really poor model for the young learner. So look carefully at the language and adapt it where you need to. Be critical of what, what's written in these books, which are especially for young, for young learners. So the next thing is look for stories with a lot of rhyme and repetition. Um, a great example of this is one you probably all know called Brown Bear, Brown Bear, what do you see? I see a red bird looking at me. <sighs> who, who doesn't love that book? Especially for the young learner classroom and teaching English. Mm. So, um, that's a great example. Practice the story by reading it aloud to yourself first to make sure that you can find a certain flow as you read. If you pick up a book and try and read it without having rehearsed, your English will not flow. And that's everyone. That's just true. You need to rehearse this. And you'll want to be consistent with how you read it. It should feel really like it flows. Think of the book. Um, oh, I know a good example here. Think of the book Dear Zoo. Dear Zoo doesn't have a lot of rhyme. It has a lot of repetition. But if you practice reading it, you can find a flow in it. And I'll talk to you about why the flow is so important. Um, Dear Zoo, I wrote to the zoo to send me a pet. So they sent me an elephant. But he was too big, so I sent him back. I've rehearsed that and read that story so many times to my learners. That, again, I, I would love to share the link with you. You should check out my Instagram account uh, later if you can, and you'll find Pedro, three years old, reading this book. And his intonation and, and connected speech is just amazing, just amazing, just from reading a story. So powerful. Um, so Dear Zoo is a great example of practicing a story so it gets a flow, and by reading it repeatedly with your students, they're going to, to pick that up. You want to modify the length uh, or the language if you need to, but make sure you're noting that down so that you, again, you've got to be consistent. So every time you're reading it, you're reading it in the same way. Um, and read the book many times to your kids. They love it. They love hearing stories, especially stories that are read well and have lots of interaction in them. Give them opportunities also to read on your own and you'll find that if you're reading aloud to them, they'll start naturally reading aloud uh, to themselves and that's a great opportunity for you to get around the classroom and monitor, monitor, listen to what they're saying. Um, if, I could, if I could show you this, this video of Pedro, recording him and listening back 
to, to his English as he reads was so useful for me as a teacher to see exactly uh, where he was at, what he was hearing, what he wasn't hearing, um, different pronunciation problems that he was having, pronunciation problems that I had expected him to have that he didn't have. Um, I'll give you one example there, the word pet, that last T sound for a lot of Brazilian Portuguese speakers sounds like a ch, uh, or, or we, we will be pronounced like a ch, so it would be pech, pech. Didn't hear that at all when he was reading, it was really quite surprising and lovely. Anyway. Anyway, observing children uh, reading out loud or speaking out loud in these kinds of controlled uh, practice kind of activities are a wonderful way for you to get data on where your students are at and what you need to work on next. I learn a lot from observing my students. But you have to create time in your lesson to, for this to happen. Um, a big problem that I've had for many years was packing my lesson full of activities and now, nowadays, I allow a lot more space in my lessons to let the children uh, read books freely, play freely, and this is a great time for me to monitor what they're doing. Okay, so, um, uh, when I monitor my students, this, this, is, this could be a whole session talking about correct, correction, and I don't have time to get into this uh, in detail. But it's worth mentioning it. Going back to this example of Pedro at free reading time, reading this story aloud to, to his friends, okay, um, me listening to him, he made quite a few mistakes, as you could expect. What kind of correction do you think I gave him? What kind of correction did you give to your students who were reading the story um, or participating in the speech? activity and you could hear that they're having pronunciation problems, um, what would you do? Collective feedback, great, Bruno, after the reading's done. And that feedback can come in many different forms. If you have built up your repertoire of different little chants and songs and activities that you could do for working on specific features of pronunciation that you know are typically challenging for the group, you could do a little chant or song that would work specifically or explicitly on that particular problem that you could hear as being common. Drills a chance. Oh, we're on the same wavelength, Bruno. <laughs> Fantastic. Sylvie's typing an idea as well. I, I'm looking forward to hearing what you say, Sylvie. Oh, some other people are typing their ideas too. As you begin to work more with pronunciation in your lessons, it's also important for you to consider how you're going to give feedback to your learners. And I mean, this is something for me that I began focusing on, pronunciation feedback in my lessons, but also as a mother. I need to start giving explicit feedback and correction to my little young learner at home if he's going to keep improving. An action exercise to help them create the sound well. Fantastic. A right or wrong game. Okay. Oh, you usually do an action. Oh, I understood. Yeah, great. This is, these are great ideas. Thank you so much for all of you to all of you for sharing. Um, like I said, there's not a lot of time to go in and look at correction techniques in this workshop, but it's definitely worth mentioning briefly that children shouldn't be overcorrected, especially when they're practicing freely and taking risks with the language, just like in this, this video clip that I was talking to you about, about Pedro reading. The stage of the lesson that, that 
that was this free reading time. This is exactly when each child can take a book from our shelf and read it to themselves. And I, like I said, I use this term to time to observe and take notes on grammar, vocabulary, and pronunciation. And it's such a joy to see the language which emerges spontaneously as they're flipping through these books. And this happens at lots of different lesson stages, but we're talking about storytelling. Um, and it just confirms to me the importance of making sure that we're providing students with good quality input in our lessons, but not just in the songs and stories, but one of the richest sources of input in the classroom is our teacher talk. Which is kind of funny because, oh, it's kind of funny because, um, I don't know how many of you have done a CELTA or a, a DELTA or a Trinity certificate or a diploma, but everybody always talks about reducing teacher talk, teacher talk time and increasing student talk time, and absolutely, I'm not here to argue that we shouldn't get students talking and in class. I think we need to really look at the quality of our teacher talk in the young learner classroom especially and think about the impact and or the influence or, or the benefit you know that we can provide for our students by, by being mindful of how we're using our language. And I saw a, a talk earlier this year by Elsa Souza, who is a, a Brazilian uh, English teacher. He's wonderful. What a great speaker. And, and he said this, and this is a little quote I picked up from his talk that he gave, grading language doesn't mean abandoning features of connected speech. If we teach speaking word for word, our students will never learn how to join them. So this, this resonated very strongly with me because I see, I observe a lot of teachers, and some people like to grade their language down to a level thinking that by talking really slowly, their young learners are going to understand better. And it just doesn't work like that. It just doesn't. He talked about, Elsie talked about the role of teacher talk and the development of the pronunciation of our learners. And I think he makes an excellent point. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, pronunciation matters. We have to acknowledge the importance of providing quality teacher talk in the young learner classroom. Um, Children need lots of natural, clear language that provides them with a model that they can copy. I mean, why do so many teachers feel like they need to modify their language to the point where it becomes unnatural? I don't know. I think, like I said, that many people feel that beginner students are not going to understand them. Let me teach you an easy way. An easy way that you can... This is, this is, this is something that I, I, work, uh, I work on a lot in my teacher training sessions. Is this is a strategy that you can use to transition your students from one activity to another in a way that they will understand you perfectly. It retains all the beautiful features of pronunciation and it doesn't involve using L1. Okay? This is what it is. This is great for all of that classroom management talk that you use in your classroom. I always say that in the young learner classroom, I spend the first six months singing. That's because in the beginning, I add music to all of my classroom instructions, basically. Not all of them, I'm exaggerating. Um, but I do, I use a lot of music in my classroom instructions. So, for example, to start the class, I will sing. I will sing. Um, you know, I'll have a song to start the class. I think everybody does that. And I'll get them to come and sit down on the floor. But instead of using a one to request that they go and sit down in the classroom on the floor, I will sing it. And I'll sing Come sit down on the floor, come and sit down on the floor, come and sit down, come and sit down, come and sit down on the floor. Hey! Super simple song, um, like really easy. They recognize the tune before they understand the individual word, and that's true. And they will, um, they will hear that tune very quickly, hear that tune, recognize what it is that is expected of them, and I don't need to use L1, I don't need to do anything like that. This is a classic technique. Uh, I use it for lots of different lesson set stages, like you can see on my slide there. Circle time, circle time, circle, circle, circle time. Five, four, three, three, two, one. I've got a song for everything. Story time, story time. So 
by having by singing your classroom instructions in the beginning, you have the, an amazing, amazing technique for managing your class, providing them with input, and as the year progresses, you start taking that music away. Um, so this 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 is very deliberate. I, this is deliberate and planned. And after a while, I remove the music from these commands, and it becomes come and sit down on the floor. Beautiful intonation, natural input there for the students. It's circle time. And then the next stage after that is switching it up or extending it. So then, come and sit down on the floor. You can actually start saying, come and sit down next to me, come and sit down on a chair. And children will pick up these chunks. Finally, by the end of the year, you're going to see these, the children using this language too, naturally, fluently, appropriately, and with intelligible pronunciation. So teach them, uh, uh, provide a, a good model for them, and they will learn too. These were a few ideas of how you can integrate pronunciation work into your lessons. Just by raising your awareness, you can make small changes to what you're already doing, but they're going to have a big impact. <sighs> so, I think the fact that we're all here today to discuss pronunciation in the Young Learner Classroom is a clear sign that this is an area of language teaching that we all value and recognise as being important, and an integral part of language teaching and learning. Now, I'd like to post or pose to you the same question that I asked at the start of this session. Is it reasonable to expect young learner teachers to work on pronunciation with their learners? All the other responsibilities that they already have. And is it even worth dedicating a limited class time to this? Well, what do you say? I hope that in this session I've managed to convince you to give a few new things a try. Thank you very, very much if you have any questions. Uh, doubts or uh, suggestions, ideas that you'd like to share, please go ahead. So it's time for questions. If you have any questions for Claire, please type them in the chat box so that she can answer. We still have a few minutes for questions. I'd be delighted to connect with any of you after this as well. Um, so feel free if you wanted to private message me or get in contact later with your ideas or suggestions. There is a blog post about this talk coming up too, so you can uh, check out those ideas. I could even include uh, a document where you can get the instructions.
of that if you wanted to do some more reading. I, what made me think of that, that was Susanna's question. Um, if you go back here to my list, you'll see that there should be there. Okay, so that was very, very good, Claire. So thank you very much um, for this great webinar with so many practical ideas for incorporating phonological approach to teaching uh, young learners.